we've been talking about the, the Holy Spirit for um, almost a couple months. And uh, when we get to, got to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, I said there's really only one expression from God that's manifested in the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that is love. Everything that God does is love. Even the things that we don't like, it's an expression of his love. Even the things that we don't understand, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a way and a plan and goodness and, and kindness and, and, and all of those things. God is a God of love. So the joy and the peace and the patience and kindness and the goodness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and the self-control, those are all just part of God's grateful love. What you see in this room, right? It's an expression of love. It's the story of Christ. Um, I'm not too sure that I like the, the snake in here, though. <laughs> That's not the kind of Baptist we are, amen? I always said if somebody brought in snakes, I'd find them a back door or make them one. I don't know. No forked tongues in the church building. But uh, other than that, it looks great. It looks good. There's been a lot of work that's gone in, into all of this. And we're going to pray for Vacation Bible School. Even before I begin my message, I'm preaching today on the Great Reveal. The great, it, Jared, if you want to know the title for my message, it's called The Great Reveal. He always texts me Monday after, or Sunday afternoon and says, what was the title for your sermon? I never have to come up with something quick. We're going to be in Isaiah 53 if you're looking for it. We're going to have kids tonight come. We're going to know some of them, some of them we're not. They're going to be at different stages of their life and their spiritual journey. Some are, well, Eli, how old is he? 10, 11? He'll be 11 in August. Very first vacation Bible school. He's a great kid. He knows the Lord. There's no telling what God's going to do in his life. We're going to see some of them that are just beginning to, the, the great understanding, the great reveal. Some of them have been going through things, and some of them, uh, I, I've talked to some of them about Christ already, and uh, they weren't there yet, but you never know the circumstances of life, what God's going to do. Amen? Miss Margaret, we just love them all. We just take them the way that they are. Uh, somebody say, oh, they, they run through the hallways. Yep, they sure do, and I love it. As a matter of fact, I think I might shepherd this year. Where's Jody at? Oh, there she is. I told her this morning, I said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And she said, well, I might need you to shepherd. I'm like, go for it. I'll, I'll run around with first graders. I don't care. I like first graders. I want, I want to see some more of them. But prayer opens the door. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to us, the expression of God for us. Nothing to be afraid of. We need to be open to it. We need to be eager for it. We need to be hungering for a touch from God. And we want to begin that today. We want to begin that this morning. We want to feel that. And we want to, we want to see all the things that God has for us. They're cool and they're great. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Y'all good with that? Grab the hand of somebody or just grab the hold of God, hand of God. You know, we're going to talk today about the, that's one of the titles from, for the the very presence of Jesus. He is the arm of the Lord. Did y'all know that? We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's pray. Father, grateful that you're a God and that you know all. You know us and you love us. And you made a way for us to know you. You are high and lifted up beyond our comprehension. You are only good. You have all that is power. You express it in joy and peace and kindness and goodness. And we, wanna, we want every bit of that, Lord. We come as a dry sponge before you today. We come needing a drink of the fresh water for the, that flows from your throne, that quenches our every need in life. And Lord, we pray today for the workers for Vacation Bible School, the teachers, the the shepherds, the, the ones that will be doing music and crafts and science and lessons and all of those things. We pray that there will be great joy in this place tonight. But more than anything, we pray Jesus. We pray Jesus upon every worker. We pray Jesus upon every student. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Holy Spirit, you have been preparing for this day. You have been preparing the hearts of the kids and the workers 
And I just pray that you would reveal yourself in might and power and love. So, Lord, we just, we just commend you to our Vacation Bible School. We, we bring these children's hearts to you, Lord, for your will to be done. Now, Lord, in the next few moments, all is vain unless the Spirit of God comes. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want your word to come alive in our hearts. We're not looking for more head knowledge. Lord, we're looking for more heart conversion. <clears throat> so, Lord, we come as we are, eager for a touch from you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Jesus, when he came and he was speaking to his people on earth, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Then he made a very bold statement that we cannot tweak or change. It says, no one comes to the Father but by me. The great give is that God would want us to have everything that is God he wants us to participate in it too. He wants us to receive it too. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Now, Jesus, a little later, was speaking, and he, the, the sheep were there, and he was talking about the sheep know the voice of God. The sheep hear the voice of the, of the shepherd. But he said, I am the door. Of, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. I am the the door is what he says. The work of Jesus was to bring us to the Father. The work of the Holy Spirit was to bring us to Jesus. Have you ever said, if I were God, dot, dot, dot. If I were God, I would, have y'all ever thought that? How many of y'all have ever said that? If I were God, vengeance is mine, and I'd straighten them out like we have a right. Aren't you glad that vengeance is of God? We don't have to do that part. We can just let him do that. If I were God, there'd be no cancer. Hmm, maybe God allows things like that. If I were God, there'd be no tragedy. Maybe God knows that we are broken and we live in a broken world. And he just gave us the answer for tragedy. If I were God, there'd be no hunger. Maybe that's the reason why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If I were God, obviously we don't have the same perspective as God. We would do things differently. Jesus, or excuse me, Isaiah. <clears throat> by the way, if you're not there, get to Isaiah 53. That's where we're going to be. But in Isaiah 55, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are uh, my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways, he knows them. He's never early, he's never late, he, he's always on time. His thoughts are beyond our thoughts, and aren't you grateful that an all-knowing God knows the situations better than us? If we would be God, we would do things differently, but it would reflect our desires, our wants, our wishes, and what we value. But Malachi 3 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is perfect. He's always been perfect. He will always be perfect. So everything that he does, everything that he allows, he will make it perfect. He is always loving. And everything that he does follows his value of truth, the way, the truth, and the life. We hold to our values, but God holds to his values and his truths. Please listen to me well. Salvation is not about putting us in heaven. That's a byproduct. It's about putting heaven in us. So no matter where we are, what we go through, we have Christ with us. The blessings, the goodness, 
Isaiah 53 tells us about how God revealed Jesus, heaven's best, to us. How God took the value of heaven expressed in His Son and allowed Him to come here so that He could show us God's best, God's values, God's goodness. And if we were to accept Jesus into our hearts and into our lives... We need to accept the greatness of God and the blessings that not as we think is best for us, but as God knows that which is best for us. So this great reveal is Jesus. I love Isaiah 53. If God doesn't change my mind, we're going to go Sunday by Sunday, and we're going to look verse by verse through this great chapter because in, in Isaiah 53, it is the most wonderful, accurate picture of our Savior in the Old Testament. If we were to describe Jesus, it probably, if we had seen him in heaven with the high regal robes of glory, we would not have thought that that's how he would reveal himself on earth. We would look for him in a in a castle or a, a great place. We would look for him with splendor and, 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 and personality that just overflowed. His beauty, his talents revealed. We would see them in all that way. But understand this. God chose to reveal heaven in the person of Jesus, but not in the way that we would have understood it. Not in the way we would have done it. Isaiah 53 talks about this. Look what it says, Isaiah 53, verse 1. <clears throat> Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah is writing this, but he puts it into the, in, in the plural. Who has received, who has believed our report? He can go back to Genesis. And God has been revealing Himself generation after generation all over the world to every nation, every tongue, every people. Some would be, as the world would consider rich, some would be poor, some would be educated, some would be talented, some would be more common. But God has been revealing himself, and he's saying, who has believed this report? He's actually saying to himself, Isaiah, the other prophets, to all those uh, aged and blessed uh, elders and, and people who have been sharing the goodness of God from the very beginning until today, who's believed? Some do. Some don't. We used to call America, a Christian nation, one nation under God. We're not. We're post-Christian today. That's not the common thought. They don't follow a Christian morality. Israel does not follow the great Jehovah. You will see groups of people all over the world, but you'll never find any place that is fully devoted. As a matter of fact, it's tough for a pastor of over 36 years to say that, but you're not going to always find it in a church. You think if there was a place that he would reign, it would be the people that would be God's family. But even here, we value our values and our thoughts and our wishes and our wants. That's just common among man. But it won't be common in heaven. And... The way that the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit never testifies of Himself, but He always points to the Father because He points through Jesus Christ. Look what it says. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who is it that the Holy Spirit, when He comes, puts the brightness of the spotlight on our hearts? That's how I felt. I felt like I was sitting in a pew, minding my own business, and it was like a, a beam of light from heaven hit me 
warmed me, convicted me, as some of y'all say, stepped all over my toes, revealed my unworthiness, revealed my shame and my hopelessness, but also showed me God's grace and the, and the mercy where He would not give me what I deserved. He had so much more planned for me. And in that moment when that conviction came and that wooing came, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, the whisper of God, when it came to me, it was drawing me to Himself, His love. And a 10-year-old kid could understand it. That's what we pray for this week. For the ones that the Holy Spirit knows and has been preparing, we'll pray that that great big light of God will come and reveal Himself to them. If He does, something amazing can happen. But we're not looking for man's values. We're not looking for more head knowledge. If y'all came today to for me to take a scripture and, 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 and open it up so that you can understand and have more head knowledge, God help you. We don't need more head knowledge. What we need is more heart conversion. Everybody in this room needs to draw closer. Nobody's there yet. Everybody needs that. Not everybody wants that. We may be com comfortable. We may be apathetic. We may not have that heartburn. You know, there's bad heartburn. You take pills for that. But there's good heartburn. And you fall on your knees for that. And when you seek Him, He will be found by you. When you search for Him with all your heart. He says, who would believe this? Who would know this? I like it when it says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. You know, the arm, the righteous right arm of God, His righteousness, His strength, His power, His will. When the anointed of God comes, listen to me now, listen. We, we talk about it, typology, we talk about it as if He puts His hand of anointing on us. It's like he has a hold of the throne. He puts his hand on and all of the goodness and the, and the power and the love and the joy, he, he lays it there for us. And it's there. He doesn't hold back. It's there for our benefit. That's the closest we're going to be to heaven in his goodness. The Spirit just gives us a little glimpse of it. How did he reveal himself? Look in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him, before, her, before God, as a tender plant. In, in the writing of the Hebrew, there was no punctuation. The, when, it was, when it was translated for us, they would, they would put the punctuation in there. It, it wasn't divided up in verses. It was just all written down. But, but one of the things that I, I love is that when you get there and you see the word he, verse 2, y'all looking up there? He is capitalized. And then you move over a few words and you see the word him. And the word him is capitalized. That means it's talking about a person that is God. If it was talking about me, he wouldn't capitalize it. Right? But when it's talking about the Almighty, he capitalizes it. So he, Jesus, shall grow up before him. Him. This was God's plan. That God would send His only begotten Son into the earth. The all-eternal one, the all-powerful one, came here for us as a tender plant. He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant plant fragile my oldest son jay uh he doesn't want to kill anything like if there's a bee i'm gonna kill it 
and, and I'll apologize to the Lord when I get to heaven. I don't like, I'm allergic to bees. I don't like them, right? How many of y'all don't like spiders? How many of you grab the spiders and you take it outside and you gently lay it down and say, now go on now. Is that what y'all do? How many of you like flies? I mean, you're eating a good old-fashioned American hot dog. Where there's a hot dog, a fly will be close by. Can I get an amen? And I was out there this week, and I had a, my Bible, and I love it cool in the morning. I got my Bible outside. I have to let my dog attack me for about five minutes. You know, you have to rub him and all that kind of stuff. And this is how my dog talks. <laughs> That's the pantingest dog I've ever seen. And after I, I grab my Bible and I've got my coffee, amen, hallelujah, and praise be to his name, I got my coffee. And I look down, and, and how many of y'all have ever seen little bitty ants? And then you start looking around, and there are thousands of them, right? My son would want to be going like this, you know, walking around, not wanting to step on an ant. I do it all the time and don't even know it. I'm, I'm an ant killer, and I don't even know it because they're so small. They're so Now, they are strong little things, but they're very fragile. You can just step on them. Please hear this. Life was put in the smallest, most fragile thing. The God of the universe came and was born of a baby. Anybody ever heard of Bethlehem? You remember about King Herod with Satan's prompting? I'm, I guarantee it. He was ready to, to, to kill all of those babies in Bethlehem because he didn't want that new king of Israel to come and take control. Y'all remember? Little baby can't do anything about himself. He can't protect himself. And there's this huge thing of trying to go out there. They're killing all the babies, trying to get him. But God protected him. Y'all seen those little plants that come up and, I mean, they just, they're just a twig. When you plant corn, you know, corn has to be spaced out. But I believe in planting corn. I put a bunch down because I want to make sure it comes up. And then for the, after that, I, I'll go back and I'll pull the others up so that they space out. And you, they get about this tall, right? And there's like two little sprouts up there, just little leaves on them. And I just yank them out and get them on so they can be. And then there's always some that I miss and later on you got to pull those out. He came weak. He came small and fragile. You could, like stepping on a twig. He grew up in Nazareth. Remember what they said about Nazareth? What good thing can come from Nazareth? That's the place that God chose for him. He came humble. The son of a carpenter. When Jesus got older and went into ministry, they said, is this not Joseph's son? We can't believe. Where did this authority, where did these words, how did they come to this unlearned people? And when he revealed what God was going to do in his life, they were ready to throw him off a cliff. This should have been the people that, that celebrated that God was going to do a great thing in one of their own, this Jesus, the one who never did anything wrong. He was unexpected. He was overlooked. Look what it says. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a dry root or as a, excuse me, as a, as a root out of dry ground. Nothing looked like it could be productive. He was a twig out of dry ground. Not a full-grown fruit-bearing tree. He would grow into that. No form or comeliness, it says. There was nothing about him. There was nothing that sprang up out of him. Is what the word means. To rise up out of him. Nothing in him that made him stand out. 
If Jesus had shown up in one of our services, um, there would be nothing that would be super attractive about him. His dress, common. How much, how many uh, wardrobes did Jesus have? Did he carry a suitcase around? Didn't need to. One. One. He had no form, no attractiveness, no comeliness. That, that word is where we would think about getting an ornament. Have y'all ever seen a, like a Christmas tree and they're, they're, they're big and they're beautiful, all those ornaments you put on them to, to make them shine out? There was nothing about Jesus that made him stand out. None of that personality that oozed. Is that not what the world looks for? Is that what, not what they value? Oh, that person's a born leader. They wouldn't have said that about Jesus. Look at all their talents. Look at all the things about that person. When God chose to reveal heaven's best, he hid it. We put so much value today on someone's presence, on their personality, their visibility, their promise. But he came with no splendor, no majesty. Look what it says here, the last part of verse 2. There is no beauty that we should desire him. No physical beauty. Anybody in here ever wanted a makeover? If I could do my hair differently, how many, why is it that those who have curly hair want straight hair and those who have straight hair want curly hair? How come those who have brown eyes want blue eyes and ones who have blue eyes want green eyes? I mean, why is nothing ever good enough? Why is it that somebody that was as talented as Karen Carpenter thought she was too big and she, she was as big as my finger? And she died because of it, because she could never settle that in her own self. I mean, if you were going to pray for your children, you would probably pray that they would be the smartest, the leader of the pack, that they had all the beauty, the, all the athleticism, that they were just all these things you would want for your kid to be the most talented, the most loved, yet... That's not how the Father brought Jesus. Our value, the value of human minds, and God's value is two different things. Two different pictures. Two different expressions. It wasn't his clothes that made him. You know, ever, I think there was a book, clothes, How Clothes Make a Man. God help us. Dress for success. I'm in trouble. What is it about clothes? What is it about possessions? It's our own security. It's what we value. I, my wife sit here. She's up in the balcony. She's usually downstairs playing with the kids. She uh, missed one of my sermons. And, uh, well, she misses all my sermons. But um, I'm not sure miss is the right word. She didn't have the ability to see them. I'm not sure she misses them. But she, she, wanted to, she wanted one of my sermons. So she, she got online and was, and was listening to my sermon. And, and I said something about riches. And I went, eh. Oh, she, she said she had a cringe moment. She said, Brian, there are people in our church that have money. And I said, well, they all do. They don't have a lot, some of them. Some of them may have a lot. I, by the way, I'm going to love you all the same whether you're rich or poor. Is that good? Doesn't matter to me. Whether you're beautiful or ugly, and I'm not going to pick out who's beautiful and who's ugly. <laughs> I'm going to love you all the same. Y'all okay with that? She said, no, 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 you don't understand. That. I said, look, I think everybody understood what I was saying is if you value money more than you value God, nothing, there's nothing wrong with money. It's just a tool. It's just a tool. But if you value the tool 
more than you value the God who provides. To so many people, they like what money brings. They like things and their value, those that are rich. In our society, come on. We value the beautiful, the smart, we value the, those who have things and how they accomplish things. But I tell you what, I like the verse in Proverbs where it says, don't make me rich, don't make me poor. If I'm rich, I will forget you. If I'm poor, I will go steal. Just let me be somewhere in between. You know, we put so much value on riches. Let me just say, Psalm 62.10 says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Proverbs 11.28 says, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Proverbs 13 verse 7 says, There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. It's all right if you have money. Just don't let money have you. The decisions that we do should be God's leadership in our heart. Not ours. Jesus had no social connections. Reputation. No, he didn't have a reputation. He didn't build this huge church. Can you imagine this? The greatest preacher ever had a small band that followed him. The one that was the most dynamic, anointed preacher ever had a group of 120 when he went back to heaven. 120. In our world today, we would call that a failure because we judge by how, what is it the Baptists say? Buildings, budgets. What'd you say? Baptisms. I thought you said bathrooms. I'm like, no, we don't judge by bathrooms. <laughs> the world now knows that I can't hear. That's right. I see my, my, my preacher friends and they'll say, well, how's God blessing? How many of you got coming? How many have you baptized? We value those things. Can I, can I share with you? There's no real way of saying this without because it's a half-truth. But you can take a, a half-truth as a full lie. Is that correct? God cares about every soul, but if you're caring about numbers more than you are the souls of people, hold on. God uses money as a tool. But church... You tithe because you love God, not because I need your money. Buildings. This is not the church. We are the church. People matter. Love is what is produced by God because it's how we connect with God and with others. In the end of verse 2, it says, there is no be beauty that we should desire Him. What if God did come with all that pomp and circumstance? What if He came and He was the most beautiful, the most talented, the wisest and all that, and He, he flaunted all that? What would we see? Would we follow Him out of selfishness? Oh, I'm going to be a Christian because if I'm a Christian, then, then I'll have no problems. That's called heaven. Down, her, down here on earth, you will have problems. You will have heartaches. You will have brokenness. You will have sickness. All those years ago when I found out I was diabetic, I had a friend of mine said, well, why don't we just pray and God will heal you? I'm like, brother, if you can pray and God will heal me, I'm all for it. But whatever God thinks is best in my life, Whatever it is that God wants me to walk through, I yield myself to Him because I take Him as He is and I receive for Him as He knows is best. 
Praise be to the glory of God. If you get mad at him, it's because you value something that he actually values something better. And you're mad because he's not doing everything for you the way you would want. God was the only one who has a choice, and this is how he revealed his son. But something amazing happens. Because when the Holy Spirit is involved, he takes something that doesn't have the value of the world and shows us that it's gold. Better than that, aren't that gold stuff that we have here. More valuable. Now you can't take your riches with you, but you can use them for His glory now, and God will send those riches ahead. You can't take your your talent is not going to be the thing in heaven that goes, hey, there's the talented one. No, but if you use your talent now. The fruit of that will be seen then. Your time. Well, I don't want to do that. That's hard. I don't want to do that. That would be annoying. Do it anyway for the glory of God. Not for connections. You know, some people, they'll come and they'll join that church because all, the, all those those people, they go to that church over there and, and, and we can have connections you know, with those people. Those are the movers and the shakers. That's the popular group. I'd rather be popular in heaven than I would be on earth. I must be faithful here because that's what's valued there. Yeah, if, if he came with all the pomp and circumstance, people would have followed him selfishly for what they could get out of it rather than just love. They may have followed him out of fear. I'm just grateful that the Almighty lets me be his child. I'm a child of the King. And there are no favorites in heaven. He loves us all the same. Now that made me, you think about this. I am a joint heir with Christ. So the Father sees me the same way he sees Jesus. Perfect in him valued in him completely loved always there i will never leave you i will never forsake you now when you get in trouble you're going to want god there i'm just telling you he's already there head knowledge won't won't make it praise god i'm going to check this brain in and get something new amen, amen. i get it i get an upgrade but this heart, oh, I get to let God do a work on my heart every day. Do you love the ones God loves? Is it just about you? Well, Jesus didn't come to be king of the world, He did but he came to be the king of his people, those who love him. He came to serve us so that we would call him master. He came to save us so we could call him friend, Lord. My time is gone, but I will tell you that as a pastor, it bothers me that so many people confess Christ, but they've never had a heart conversion. They don't love the things of God. They don't give unless it benefits them. They don't give of their time. They don't give to, to, to serve. They don't share their witness. They don't share with their friends that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They, they have it in their head. But somewhere along the line, they thought, yeah, I'll accept Jesus and I'll go to heaven one day. What you need is not a head knowledge. You need a heart conversion. You've heard it all before. I hadn't said anything new. I've just reminded you, this is what God values. So for all of you people who talk about, well, I'm not that good or I can't do this or I can't do that, Quit talking about the one that God created for His glory. Get over yourself. 
You are a jewel in His eye. God can use you if you'll let Him. God will bless you beyond what you can imagine. Search for Him with all your heart. The greatest riches of all. If there is someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, if you do feel that spotlight of the Holy Spirit on you, if you do feel, do feel that conviction, if you feel that wooing and calling where He wants to change you, say yes. The greatest decision anybody could ever make. If you've made that decision, what are you doing with it? Is it about you? Are you living your life for you? Are you living your life for comfort? Are you living your life for earthly security? Are you thinking about God bless those that I love? Or are you asking God to love everyone? Church, we are the representation as the Holy Spirit is the representation. It's the, great, it's the great reveal. One thing that's valuable in heaven is Jesus Christ. The Father loves Him and has given all to Him. All judgment to Him. And the Holy Spirit says we can be a part of that. Let's be a part of that.